Okay, so before we get into the word, you know there's a few preachers that like to start with a funny. Yeah, so uh, I, I've never done that before, but while I was driving here, I was like, I should try that. So I'm going to try that. So please be merciful and laugh for me. So I'm just going to give you a, a dad joke or two. So what do you call a guy or a man with a shovel? Doug. <laughs> we, need, we need a guy with a drum kit here to go to the team. Wait a second, what do you call a guy without a shovel? Douglas. Douglas, there we go. Brilliant. Brilliant. Very good. And, and now, can you handle a, a Bible dad joke? So who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? Samson, because he brought the house down. <laughs> there we go. And, and last one. Oh no, two, two more. Uh, what, was the, what was the first tenth match in the Bible? For the Bible scholars out there. You know the sport is in the Bible? There was a tenth match that got played. Nobody read that part? So in Genesis, in the story of Joseph, it says, and Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> and, and last one, if anyone needs a boat need building, just ask me, I know a guy. Okay, there we go, that, that's it. Um, and, and the reason, uh, man, I love to start like that, is you know it says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So joy is one third of the kingdom of God. Joy is a very important component of the kingdom of God. God is a joy God. He's the author of joy. Joy is the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And it, it says that in the book of Psalms, it says there's a river in which the pleasures of God are, are freely available for the house of God. And, and so we can freely drink of the river of His pleasures. And then, so joy is a very important component of the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm going to be speaking uh, to you about this afternoon. And obviously we have the start of 2024 and New Year. Man, it's already halfway through January. Can you believe it? Um, the, the, the month is flying by. Um, but we, we still at the start of a new year. And often there's New Year resolutions and, and people setting new goals. And, and there's all this advice on how to set goals and, and to see your dreams and how to, to develop discipline to make sure they come to pass. And I just want to tell you that what you need to know in 2024 is that God is for you. Amen? And if God be for you, who can be against you? And He's so for you that He's forgiven you forever. So, so remember that going into 2024. And um, do you have um, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 for me there, France? So at the beginning of a new year, but at the beginning of any endeavor, uh, there's, there's something we need to do first. Amen? Something we need to do first. And in Matthew 6 verse 33, Jesus said what we need to do first. And, and there he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then, seek first the kingdom of God. And so amidst all the advice on New Year's resolutions and goal setting, I just want to remind you to seek first the kingdom of God. No matter what, what it is you're pursuing this year, if, you, if you're wondering what to pursue this year, look no further than those words. <laughs> and then, Pursue the kingdom of God. Pursue the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. And in, in context, there, Matthew chapter 6, it's what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so, at the beginning of uh, Matthew chapter 5, it says that Jesus went up a mountain, His disciples came to Him, and He sat down and He began to teach them. And, and he, he taught them many amazing things. I, I recommend go read uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Such good stuff. It's the biggest portion of Jesus' teaching that we have in the Bible. And in, uh, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 6, uh, Jesus started uh, teaching people not to do things outwardly and publicly, but rather to do things in private, in their relationship with God. So he said, uh, when you give to the poor, don't stand in the street corners, don't stand in the synagogue and uh, in our case in the church and, and give and make sure everyone sees it. No, rather don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So he's saying give in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. 
And then he said, for example, with prayer, he said, don't be like the hypocrites. And then he said, hypocrites love to pray. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Hypocrites love to pray. So not everything that is called prayer is godly, is of the kingdom. You know, hypocrites love to pray. Um, so I think it was Ashley and Carly Terry did. Um, they, they tell a story of their, their son or daughter, I think it was their son, came running to them. Uh, their son had been listening to Andrew and, and came running into the room and said, Dad, you're a hypocrite. And, and Ashley Derrida was like, what? And he says, no, I, I just heard Andrew say that um, hypocrites love to pray. You love to pray, so you're a hypocrite. <laughs> and so, so if you love to pray, that doesn't mean that you're a hypocrite. Um, that's not what he's saying there. But he, he's saying that religious people love to get recognition for what they're doing. Yeah, and that's religion. Religion is all about the outside. But the kingdom of God is all about the inside. We'll see just now that Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, inside. Yeah, and, and so he said, don't, don't um, be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, making long prayers, standing in the synagogue, and making sure everyone hears their prayers. Uh, but, but he said, no, when you pray, go into your closet, shut the door, and pray in secret. And when your father receives in secret, he will reward you openly. And then he said the same thing with fasting. Don't, don't let people see that you're fasting. He, he's, um, he said, don't, don't look like you're having a, a, like you've just eaten a lemon and you've got this really sour face. Yeah, like, oh, I'm fasting. No, he said, make sure you look good and so no one knows that you're fasting. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Amen? And, and then he goes on to talk about finances, money, and possessions. And he said, don't lay up treasures on the earth. I mean, don't let your wealth, your riches be outward only. Now, there's nothing wrong with having stuff as long as stuff doesn't have you. Amen? And, and so, so he said, um, don't lay up treasures in heaven, or do, uh, rather, don't lay up treasures on earth. Don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But he said, rather lay up treasures in heaven uh, where moths can't get to it, where rust can't get to it, and where thieves can't break through and steal. Amen? And, and then he went on to uh, talk about how we don't need to worry. He said, take no thought. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and don't worry about your body, what clothes you're going to put on. For life's more than food and your body's more than clothing. And then one of my, my life verses, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, he says, consider the birds of the air. Look at the birds. Amen? For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And how much more precious are you than the birds? And, then, and, and so I always tell people, bird watching is the only hobby that I can see that Jesus advocates in us every must do. And, then, and, and so when Giselle and I were getting married, uh, we were getting married, I didn't have a job, I didn't know what, I, what we were doing, we were both in Bible college, no set income, and God had just miraculously brought us together, and I just told Giselle, I said, if we ever have any financial worries, we're just going bird watching. And then, so, so we take we take what Jesus said very seriously, so so seriously that yesterday um, we travelled I think about 150 kilometres just to go see a bird. Can you imagine that? It was the, the first time we tried anything like that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but there was a, a a bird that's never in South Africa pitched up about 150 k's from here. So we went to go check the bird out. And we were taking Jesus very literally. And, then, and, then, and, and so obviously, I'm not saying you have to go bird watching to obey Jesus, but the point he's making is consider the birds of the air. Look at them. They're not worried. They're not stressing. They're not wondering how they're going to make ends meet. He said they, they don't have, um, they don't sow, they don't reap, uh, i.e. they don't work, they don't, um, they don't put seed in the ground and they don't reap a harvest. And he said they don't have bonds. Uh, that's in our terminology, we could say they don't have a bank account. Yeah. Have you ever seen a bird with a bank account? I've never gone into F&B and seen a bird there at the counter registering an account. And, and so birds don't have bank accounts and they don't even have a fridge. Can you believe it? A bird doesn't even have a fridge and yet they don't worry because your heavenly father feeds them. And then, but then he said, how much more precious are you than the birds? And so I'm not saying it's bad to have a bank account. I'm not saying it's bad to have a fridge. You know, birds don't have those things, but we do have those things. But those things aren't required 
for God to provide for us. Amen? Those things aren't required for God to get His provision through to us. And then he goes on to, he says, look at the, the flowers in the field. They don't toil, they don't spin, I, they don't make their own clothes. And yet your heavenly Father clothes them. And, and even Solomon in all of his glory did not look like a flower on the ground. Amen. And, and then he, he finishes off in uh, Matthew 6.33. And he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Everything you need, every all the the provision, all the clothes, all the food, all the water. But we can add. It says all these things, even things falling from the sky. All these things will be added. That was pretty dramatic. Wow. I don't know. It's got water, so ice. Oh, ice. Wow. We're heating things up here. Praise God. The ice is melting. Hey, we are heating things up. Glory. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. All these, all these things shall be added. It just reminds me of a verse in um, Isaiah chapter 55. I actually read it just before the service. This is amazing. Um, so in Isaiah 55, around verse 10 or so, uh, it says that God's word is like the rain and like the snow. And in the same way as rain and snow comes down, kind of like, a, it's like a demonstrative sermon here. As, as the rain and snow comes down, it doesn't return, but it, it causes plants to grow. It causes uh, things to flourish. And it says, so shall God's word be. It will not return to him void, but it will prosper in the thing where he sends it. It will succeed in what he sends it out to, to do. Amen. And so God's word is like snow, like rain, and, and as a thing, rain, it carries the atmosphere of heaven, the sky. You know, rain is in the clouds, so it carries that atmosphere, but then it brings that to earth. So God's word, when God's word is spoken, it literally brings heaven to earth. Amen? It brings the atmosphere of heaven down to earth. That's, that's the word of God, because it carries his thoughts. It carries his ways. It carries the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. And then, and remember, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And and now I mentioned it at the, the beginning. Um, in Romans chapter fourteen, verse seventeen, it says, "The kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit." Amen. But I also mentioned it earlier in Luke chapter seventeen. The Pharisees questioned Jesus, or they asked him, "When is the kingdom coming?" And, and they were asking these questions. Maybe let's put that up. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Luke 17, 20 and 21. And so, so Pharisees are asking Jesus a question. You'll find in the Gospels, if you read the Gospels, Pharisees are always questioning Jesus. And that's another aspect of religion. Religion is always questioning Questioning doesn't lead to faith. Amen. And so it says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. So, so Jesus said, Don't look up there for the kingdom of God or look there. He said, The kingdom of God is inside of you. In you. And, and I just uh, quoted Romans chapter 14, verse 17, which says, The kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. But that Jesus said, The kingdom of God is in you. <laughs> so which is it? It's both. The kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit now? There we go. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Amen. So the Holy Spirit has been placed within our spirit if we've been born again, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, so the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 17 says, He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. United, no separation, no disconnection. One spirit. So the Holy Spirit is placed in your spirit. Yeah, and so, so when we're seeking first the kingdom of God, it's not about outward, it's about the inward. It's all about the heart. 
That's why one of my one of my mantras, if I go for a walk and I'm, I'm spending time with the Lord, then I always start with begin within, start with the heart. Begin within, start with the heart. Because in Proverbs chapter four it says, God your heart will do it, for out of it flow the issues of life. So so the, the, the condition of your heart dictates the state of your life. If you don't like the state of your life, start with the heart. As your heart changes, your life will change. It begins within. Yeah? And the kingdom of God is within you. And remember, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Think about it. Seek first the kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, and His righteousness. So there's a double emphasis on righteousness. Seek first righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. So there's a double emphasis on righteousness, and that's because righteousness is what the Gospel is all about. Amen? The end result of the Gospel is righteousness. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God and the salvation. Why is the gospel the power of God and the salvation? Because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Righteousness, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. We sang that song, uh, Good News, and I think one of the verses or the chorus, it says, this is good news, and it says, an empty grave, i.e. Jesus being alive. That's the good news. That Jesus has been raised from the dead, that he's alive forevermore. And the last verse of Romans, I think it's Romans, or the last verse of Romans chapter 4, I think it's Romans 4.25, it says that Jesus was delivered up for our offenses, i.e. Uh, he was crucified, he was killed for our sins, and he was raised for our justification. He was raised for us to be made right with God. So he was killed because of our sin. He went to the cross because of our sin. He became sin on the cross. And he was raised so that we can be justified. So the reason why it's good news that there's an empty grave is because that means you are justified. Amen. 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 Because Jesus is alive, you are justified. And because of Ryan, it's awesome. So because Jesus is alive, you are justified. And then that is the good news. You know, it's not just a story about Jesus. It's a story about you too. His crucifixion was your crucifixion. His death was your death. And His resurrection was your resurrection. Amen. Because He's alive, you are justified. And then it says in Romans chapter 3 that uh, the law was written to men who were under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. But then it says, but now the righteousness of God is revealed. Independent, without the law and the prophets, had nothing to do with your efforts, had nothing to do with your performance, but the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all men that believe, for there is no difference for all of sin that come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. Everyone is sin that comes short of the glory of God. And it goes on to say, therefore being justified freely by His grace. Amen. Being justified freely by His grace. It's not about what you can do for Him, it's about what He's done for you. Amen? That's why it's good news. Not just good news, it's the exceedingly, wonderfully, amazingly, blissfully good news. It's the best news ever, and it's the power of God and His salvation. Amen? It's literally the most powerful thing in the universe. Because it has the power to save your sin, it has the power to restore your soul, it has the power to bring prosperity in every single area, spirit, soul, body. Amen? In your relationships, in your finances, let's give God some prayer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And then, so, so when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he's emphasizing, seek the righteousness of God. Yes. And, then, and the problem, the reason why he got so mad with the religious people is because they were seeking righteousness with God by their own performance, by their works, under the law. And you can never be made right with God by your works. The law was not given to make us right with God. The law was given to show us that we weren't right with God. The law was given to give us the knowledge of sin. The law was actually given to make sin come alive. To show you that there's a problem on the inside. That you need a savior. You need to believe and receive salvation. Amen. So once you believe and receive salvation, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
old things have passed away, all things are become new. Amen? Amen. And in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, it says, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen? Amen. Righteousness and true holiness. Just before that, Ephesians 4, 22, it says, Put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Other translations say, Be renewed in your mind by the spirit. And then it says, Put on the new man. So how do we put on the new man? By being renewed in our mind by the Holy Spirit, by receiving the truth of God's word, by sitting under good teaching, by doing Bible study, by, by searching the scriptures, by renewing your mind by the word of God through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then so we put on the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness. And if we are seeking first righteousness, the righteousness which God gives us, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, you know it's not even by your faith. It's by the faith of Jesus Christ. We simply believe so that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, by His faith. So that's all there is to it. Just believe. Only believe. There's, there's a time where, where uh, Jesus said to a man, He said, only believe. That's good advice. That's advice from the Lord Jesus Himself, the head of the church. Only believe. Amen. And how do we believe? Faith comes by? And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. And just before Romans 10 verse 17, Paul gives the process of faith. He says, he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he says, How shall they call if they haven't heard? How shall they call if they haven't heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? And that's why it's written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of those who preach the gospel of peace. Amen. And so the process of faith is a preacher needs to be sent. Sent by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the body of believers might be involved, but it needs to be by the Holy Spirit. Not by mind, nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when a preacher is sent and he preaches, then the message, the gospel, can be heard. And when the message is heard, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And when that faith comes, then we can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Amen. That's the simplicity of faith. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, just before that, it says, With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen. Amen. With the heart we believe. So what I, I mentioned how important the heart is, out of the heart flow the issues of life. So what do we need to do with our heart? Believe unto righteousness. And then so, so the heart of man is the core of his being. It's the very center of his nature. It's the heart. And, and that is your believer. Your heart is your believer. Amen? And, and so with the heart we believe unto righteousness. That is what you need to use your believer for. Because if you use your believer to believe unto righteousness, then all these things will be added. Because then there's no fear. There's no guilt. There's no shame. There's nothing that's going to stop the flow of God's grace coming towards you. And then I once, I once heard Brother Nasha say that if believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth can get you out of hell, it can get you out of anything. <laughs> and, then, and if believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth can get you into heaven, it can get you into every blessing and favor of God. Amen. Amen. And, and just on things Brother Nasha has said, um, he mentioned 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 during the offering message uh, today. And that's where it says, And God is able to make all grace to abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Man, what a verse. There's a lot of all in there. Amen? That he's able to make all grace to abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And then, and, and the, one, the one day um, I was out traveling and man, I was starting to feel, feel tired and then I, the Lord just gave me a picture and man, it was such a, a blessing. And I had this picture of this massive dam and, and the dam was full of water and below the dam there was a village and this village was thirsty, this village was dying of, of thirst and there was a dry river there running next to it. And in the picture, I'm like, man, the water's right there. But these people below, there's a driver over there, they, they die without water. 
And I'm like, man, that damn wall just needs to come down. And suddenly, I understood. God is able to make all grace to abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. I need the dam is full. Amen. The water of the Holy Spirit is there. The grace of God is there. But sometimes there's a damn wall in the way. Amen. <laughs> and am I allowed to say that in church? Is that okay? Your pastor says it's okay, so it's okay. So, you know what our problem is? A damn wall. That's the problem. And, and so, so sometimes in our heart, there's, there's damn walls. And what it comes down to is pride. Amen. Pride is a damn wall. Pun intended. Yeah, that, that's, that's the only thing that stops the flow of God bless, God's blessings in our lives. And I'm preaching to me as much as I am to you. Because pride is as much my problem as it's your problem. It's the problem of humanity. Amen. It's the original sin and that was in Lucifer, that was in Satan. And that's the original sin that, that came to it. Pride is the problem. Pride is the only thing that stops the blessing of God. It stops the flow of God's grace. But imagine all of that water there, that village below, struggling, only just surviving, not thriving. But imagine that damn wall came crumbling down and that water started to flow and that riverbed opened up. Suddenly there's water, there's water for their crops, there's water for their cattle, there's abundance, there's prosperity, there's enough for them to flourish and prosper. Amen. And, and so the damn wall needs to come down. And then uh, Leon, in the, the first service of the year, he mentioned Jeremiah chapter 1. And he talked about Jeremiah's calling. And Jeremiah, the Lord appeared to him. And he said, I've, I've set you over the nations. I've put my words in your mouth. And he said, I've set you to uh, break down, to destroy, to tear down, to uproot, and then to build and to plant. So, so he first said, I've, I've sent you to break down, to, to uproot, to destroy, to pull down. And then he said, and then to build and to plant. Yeah, and so, there's a reason Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because he always had these, these prophecies and declarations that made the people so mad at him. But he needed to pull down before he could build up. He needed to root out before he could plant. And, then, and it's the same in the garden of our heart. Sometimes we need to root out and pull up before we plant. And, and sometimes in the building of things, in the building of whatever it is, it might be just building a good day, or building a marriage, or building a ministry, or building a business. Sometimes we need to break down before we build up. Amen? Yeah, and, and Jesus, when, when He came, He was breaking down the old covenant of the law. That performance-based mentality. And that's what's needed. Before we can build up grace, before we can build a belief system of grace, a belief system centered on the gospel, I call it grace and rest, belief system, we need to break down law and works. Amen? We need to uproot, take out law and works. You know, that, that's what needs to be removed before we can build. And that's why Jesus was so... Man, with the Pharisees, the, the scribes, he just went for them because he was trying to break down the damn wall of pride that was in them. It's not because he hated them, it's because he loved them. Yeah. You know, it, the one time there was a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit salvation or inherit eternal life? Firstly, dumb question. What must I do to inherit? Yeah. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. It's a moronic ox. It's a paradox. What must I do to inherit? You inherit just because you're born. Yeah? You, amen? You're born into an inheritance. You don't have to do anything. But anyway, Jesus said, you've read the law, what's written in the law. And he said, man, I've kept everything from, from when I was this high, when I was little. And, and it says in Mark, it says, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. And said, the one thing you lack. Go, sell all you have, and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Wow. And now, Jesus, he was making the stand so high, trying to break this guy's damn wall. You know, he, was, he was trying to break through so that his grace, so that this guy would drop and say, Okay, God, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. Be merciful to me. And if that had happened, the grace of God could have just flowed to him through the day. And so, so when Jesus has been harsh to the religious people, it's not because he hates them. 
because we love them. Amen. And in ministering, if, if you go out and evangelize or minister on the streets, you'll, you'll find there's different types of people. There's some that are just at rock bottom and they're just ready yeah. for the mercy and grace of God. And you can just pour it out on them. You can just, man, Jesus loves you, man. There's nothing that He hasn't forgiven you of. He's forgiven you, etc. And they're just ready. And that grace will just flow towards them. But there's other people you come across and it's like, no, X, I'm in this church or I've been, etc. And they start listing everything they've done, everything they're involved in. And it's just like, and then, then you've got to bring up the law. Then it's time to get it on. Then it's like, okay, have you, have you told a lie before? Have you, and, and you know in James chapter 2 verse 10, it says, if you keep the whole law and you have it in one point, you're guilty of all of it. Yeah, and, and so sometimes in, in evangelism and ministering to people on the street, you have to discern, is this person ready just for the gospel and the grace of our Lord Jesus? Or does this person need the law to bring them to the end of themselves so they're ready to receive the grace of God? Amen? And that's the true purpose of the law. So, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added. And then in 2024, I want to encourage you to keep the main thing the main thing. Keep this the first and foremost, because this is the gospel. Righteousness is what the gospel is all about. It's about how to be made right with God, not by your works, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. I like to say that being justified is to be acquitted of guilt, rendered innocent, and qualified for every good and perfect gift that God has for you. Amen. It, so to be justified is to be acquitted of guilt, i.e. you're not guilty, you're blameless, you're innocent, so to be rendered innocent and to be qualified for every good and perfect gift. And then you know James one seventeen it says that um, God every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights. And then so every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And so what qualifies you? The gospel, the good news of the grace of God. And then, and you know Jesus when He started preaching in Mount chapter one it says that He started preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he said, his message was, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. That was his message, and that's the same message today. You know, the gospel of the kingdom of God is the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel of everything that he has done for you. It's the, it's the good news, the, the, the glad times, the happy message. And, then, and, and so, so when Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel, Often we get stuck on that word repent, yeah. And we and as soon as someone says repent, everyone's like, oh no, I'm going to get shot at and told what a sinner I am and that I'm going to hell. When Jesus said repent, he was talking about repent from your mindset, from your belief of trying to earn righteousness. From it says in Hebrews chapter six. Um, so so I'm just I'm just preaching a whole bunch of stuff now. I'm not ex- I'm not really teaching too much. So what's the difference, people say, between preaching and teaching? About 20 minutes. So you can preach it very quick, but if you're going to teach it, you're going to have to take a long time. And so, so preaching is proclaiming, teaching is explaining. And so I'm just preaching a whole um, bunch of things to you now, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word being preached, amen? But we need to be discipled as well, we need to be taught, and so that's what Bible school's for. Yeah, so I want to encourage you, enroll in Bible school. Get, get good teaching. Go, man, Andrew Womack's got thousands of hours free downloadable stuff. Amazing. You can just go and, and download it, and that will teach you, that will reach you, that will disciple you. So we, we need that. But the message that he preached was repent and believe the gospel. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about the foundation. Uh, actually, the writer says, let's go on beyond the foundation. Come on, we, we should be further along by now. But when he said this, he, he lists six things that are the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. The, the foundation. And, and the first two are repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Yeah, so, so the foundation of the doctrine of Christ, the foundation of Christianity, if you want the foundation of following Jesus, is number one, repent from dead works. Number two, faith towards God. I.e. repent and believe the gospel. Yes. Amen. So the repentance is repenting from your own efforts. 
your own striving, your own trying, your own good works, your own, the things that you do to try to earn God's favor or earn righteousness. Amen? So repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Believing, not achieving. Yes. Trusting, not trying. Resting, not wrestling. Amen. Amen. And then, and, and <laughs> so it's about believing, not achieving, trusting, not trying, resting, not wrestling. And then, and just just on that note, uh, so a personal word uh, the Lord's given me for the year is just rest, and well, that's pretty much every year because that's what we need to do. Right? And, but, but specifically, when when I first arrived here, I met a guy uh, out in the park and. And I met him like three times, but crazy coincidence. We were just in the same place at the same time. Anyway, on the third time, I asked his name, and he said his name is Noah. And I said, hey, do you know your name means rest? And he didn't, he didn't actually know that. So Noah means rest. Yeah, so, so that's the name Noah, it means rest. And in Genesis chapter 6, we get introduced to Noah in the Bible. And we also get introduced to the word grace for the first time. Yeah, so, so let's put up um, Genesis 6 verse 8. Can you put that up in King James there front? Let me just check. Um, still, in, still in time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Genesis 6 verse 8. Uh, so, so Genesis 6 verse 8 is when we first see the word grace in the Bible. That's the first appearance that grace makes. Uh, in word form in the Bible and interestingly I'll just throw it out there just before that it talks about how every imagination of man's thought was only evil continually and it says that man was just thinking of evil things and it was so bad that God repented that he even made man he was sorry that he even made man so if you read just before uh, Genesis 6 verse 8 it's the worst description of mankind I can find in the whole Bible it's really bad. He said every thought was only evil. I mean, people were only thinking of evil things. Can you imagine that? Yeah, sure. And so it paints a picture of the worst state of mankind. And that is where grace makes its appearance. Wow. That is the stage that was set for grace to come on to. Yeah, and, and so it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so everything was a mess, men were only thinking of evil things, there was just sin everywhere, it was horrible, but Noah found grace. And then, and Romans chapter 5 verse 20, it says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen? Where sin abounds and increases, grace abounds and increases much more. Much more. And in the Greek, where it says grace abounds much more, that word in the Greek is hyperparismo. It's an amazing word, because parismo means to superabound. Yeah, so parismo is already a word of, it's increasing so much, but this word is hyper parismo. So it's literally a superlative of superabound. So it's like super, super, superabound. It's literally hyper superabound. So where sin abounds, grace hyper superabounds, super superabounds. Oh, you boast of it. Oh, just blows it out. Amen. Amen. And that's why God, grace is God's answer to the problem of sin. Amen. Grace is the only thing that can conquer sin. Amen. It says in Romans 6.14 that sin will not have the meaning of you, for not under the law, but under grace. So grace is the only thing that can break the power of sin. Not your own efforts, not your own striving, not your own performing, not your own fasting, praying, etc., etc., etc. Only grace. And then, and, and so, so then it says in Genesis 6 verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And what does Noah mean? So rest finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then, and so, amen. Let's give the Lord a thank you. Amen. Amen. So, yes, it's my personal word, but you can take it if you want it. Rest. Rest finds grace. When we rest, God can work. And that's what grace is. Grace is God working on man's behalf. 
Yeah, when we rest, God works. But if we're going to work, then God's going to need to rest. Amen. And, and I'm not saying we don't do good things, and I'm not saying we don't, that doesn't cause us to produce action. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, Paul said, I labor more abundantly than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God that's with me. Grace will cause you to work harder than anyone. Grace will cause you to reach more people than anyone else. Grace will, but it's no longer you doing it. It's Christ in you. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And then, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, i.e. by grace. So rest finds grace in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And that's a, a good note to bring it in for a landing and, and take some communion. Because that's one of the ways that we can actively rest or labor to enter into rest is to take communion. So I invite you to, to come grab the, the elements and, and let's rest in the finished work of the Lord together.